Hey, welcome to OA Week 2023, and this is the Caribbean Hub session. So welcome and thank you for joining us. My name is Kalina Grab, and I am a Canal Cell and International Policy in the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program. And I'm also a part of the Golan Secretariat. So I would like to note that this session is being recorded. OA Week is presented by Go On, the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network. And Go On has three sponsoring organizations. First, NOAA, the United States National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Second, the IEA OAICC, the International Atomic Energy Agency, Ocean Acidification International Coordination Center. And third, IOC UNESCO, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Con Commission of the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. GOAN was established in 2012 with just a handful of members. And since then, GOAN has grown immensely. It now has over a thousand from 114 different countries. GOAN also consists of nine regional hubs which span across continents and oceanographic regions. And we'll be hearing from most of them throughout OA Week, including this hub, which is the newest hub, the Caribbean hub. So if you are not a member yet of GOAN, you can join today by visiting goon.org, and I just placed the link in the chat as well. So OA Week debuted in 2020 and returned in 2021, when events and conferences were postponed due to COVID-19. Following the successful in-person symposium on the oceans and high CO2 world in 2022, GoOn is bringing back OA Week 2023 to maintain momentum around OA research and provide a virtual platform for the ocean acidification community to exchange their latest findings. We are thrilled to present a wide range of ocean acidification topics and speakers from around the world. During the session today, all participants are in listen-only mode. You are welcome to type any questions into the question box, which can be found in the bottom of the control panel, likely on the right-hand side of your screen. And we'll be monitoring the incoming questions and we'll pose them to the speakers during the question and answer section, which will be immediately following the final presentation. For the discussion, you can also use the raise hand function in the toolbox at the bottom of your screen, and we can call on you and you can answer, ask your question directly. So with that, I'm thrilled to introduce the Caribbean Hub. This is our newest hub and it was formed within the last month. We now have the new webpage live and I put the link in the chat. And so this is a screenshot of what the new webpage looks like. And you can visit this webpage and join the hub via that link as well. And you'll notice on the map here, the members of the Caribbean Hub include the wider Caribbean region, including the US mainland. And so today we'll be hearing more about the specifics of this hub and a little bit about its formation. So with that, first I would like to introduce our moderator for this session, Jose Martinez Ortiz, who is currently at the University of Puerto Rico, and he is assisting with monitoring seawater outflows of the Ecoelectrica power plant in Bahia de Guayanilla, Puerto Rico, for regulatory compliance with DNA environmental and he is also for DNA environment, and he is also developing a thesis to assess hypoxic events recorded in Paraguay, Puerto Rico. So, Jose, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Kalina. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm excited to introduce the newly formed Caribbean Goeon Hub, which covers the wider Caribbean region, focusing on areas not covered by neighboring hubs. Forming this hub is a critical first step in increasing the region's capacity for OA monitoring, research, collaboration, and communication. We will see the results of the OA needs-based assessment and the work that led to the formation of the hub. We will also highlight work done by being conducted by current hub members. But with that said, I'm proud to be introducing our hub members throughout the session, but we will begin with an overview of the hub formation from, from those that help facilitate this hub, the formation of the hub. And we'll start with Natalie Lord. She is a 2023 Canals Fellow in the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program. As a capacity building, and stakeholder engagement fellow. And a portion of her portfolio this year is to engage with the OA community in the Caribbean region to aid in capacity building, 
efforts for research and monitoring. And today her presentation is titled Caribbean Ocean Acidification Community Needs-Based Assessment in Goyon Hub Formation. And the floor is yours, Natalie. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. To presentation mode. Start my timer. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for having me today. Um, I will be presenting on our needs-based assessment that was conducted this past spring. Um, so to give some background, I'd like to share this um, short timeline of the past several years. So um, our office at NOAA has been focused on capacity building efforts for research, ocean acidification research in the Caribbean region. Um, we know that it, it will have impacts on the goods and services that Caribbean marine environments provide that are especially vulnerable to ocean acidification, such as coral reefs. Um, so it's a critical, important um, area for our office to focus on. So through uh, starting in 2019, through a resolution passed at the Cartagena Convention Conference of the Parties, um, it call, that called for a regional collaboration and action, um, both regional bodies of the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission and the United Nations Environment Program encouraged greater ocean acidification monitoring capacity and multidisciplinary and inclusive stakeholder engagement in the region. So starting in 2021, um, we have two different, basically, we've, we've got the Caribbean Community of Practice. So this is a group of um, researchers at NOAA, along with collaborators from different academic institutions and NGOs that work to um, establish a group focused on capacity building um, to strengthen capacity for research, monitoring, and mitigation of ocean acidification in the Caribbean region. So working in tandem with existing efforts led by groups and organizations such as Remarco, Io Caribe, Caracus, Caricom, and the Ocean Foundation, this effort brought together many different ocean practitioners from the region. And um, originally, the, the goal of the community of practice was to distribute a needs-based assessment to the community members who are working on ocean acidification research and monitoring in the region to gain information about the needs that they have for their research, what barriers they might be experiencing, and the ways in which we might be able to support their research moving forward. So um, we did some, of course, we have background research. So we know that there are nine regional hubs um, in 2023, now there are 10, um, which we are very excited about. But basically, there are go on hubs across the, the world, and um, the Caribbean region was lacking um, as a space for a network specifically for scientists in this region. Um, we know, we knew going into the survey that there were many different um, countries that did have go on members. Um, most of them are members, or they might be general member, or they're members of the Latin American hub or the North American hub. Um, so we wanted, you know, by creating this new go on hub, we were able to provide a network specifically for the people who are living in this region. So the survey uh, was implemented from February through June of this year. And we had a purpose of sampling frame. So the goal was to reach scientists who are currently conducting biological, chemical, and physical monitoring, as well as any socioeconomic assessments alongside um, their natural science data collection. Um, interestingly, we did, had just 15 um, individuals that took the survey conducting socioeconomic research. So that is a new area. Um, that might, we might be able to expand upon in the region moving forward. Uh, we had 75 respondents. And as I said earlier, the goal was to assess the current state of ocean observing capacity for the region. So we received a wide diversity of participants from all different nations in the Caribbean. 
And we're really happy about the response rate that we received as well as the diversity of nations. So we had individuals take the survey from 25 different countries in the wider Caribbean region. We asked survey respondents about their main concerns of ocean health, as well as what concerns their, their own stakeholders are asking them about. Um, so top on the list was coral reef health, not surprising. Um, this was provided by 59% of respondents and within that frame, they were most interested in disease, bleaching and ocean acidification was third on the list as a concern for coral reef health. Next, we had concerns about water quality. That was about half of the respondents. Um, so coastal pollution, harmful algal blooms, sargassum, inundations, and then marine debris was also a concern. Next, we asked about barriers for their research for ocean acidification. 64% um, of respondents discussed the barrier of funding. So ocean acidification, monitoring and observing is extremely expensive and having um, equipment and the ability to maintain this equipment can be a challenge, especially for remote areas. Um, and then also having access to research facilities, research vessels and trained staff was, was also a barrier. Um, next, we had technical capacity. So 74% of respondents indicated that this was a challenge for them for their research. Um, so this is gaining access to monitoring equipment, having trained staff for data collection, and then having the skills for data management and sharing, and then having access to regional baseline data was also listed as a barrier for researchers in the region. Um, we had about 53% of participants have received training about ocean acidification research and largely this was, these are more low cost um, training in, and sampling methods like bottle sampling and pH and alkalinity analysis in the lab. And then we had just 28% of participants receiving funding um, or instrumentation for studying ocean acidification in the region. So we definitely need to increase our funding mechanisms for ocean acidification research in the Caribbean moving forward. Um, next, we asked about the parameters that they were measuring and where they were measuring them. So largely the researchers here are measuring near in the nearshore environment, in coral reef ecosystems, and um, primarily, you know, more low cost parameters. So salinity, temperature, pH, nutrients, um, the more challenging and more um, cost prohibitive parameters like PCO2 and total inorganic carbon are not as commonly sampled throughout the region. Um, next, we asked about the strengths that the researchers thought of for their research networks. And um, two main points came up from the survey results and that was that the use of their social network. So they re really rely on each other for collaboration across um, their nations and within each country. They rely on their students and um, to help conduct the research and carry out the research. And then also um, institutional support to be able to carry out these research um, and monitoring projects. Next, they also highlighted research expertise. So having skills in biogeochemistry, modeling and field monitoring for ocean observing was a necessary skill that allows them to do the work that they are carrying out right now, access to grant and funding, and then overall passion, motivation, and collaboration were listed as a strength for the researchers here. We also asked about the Go On Network. So we asked participants if um, established, would, did they, would they think that the Go On Hub would be beneficial? We had um, over 43% of our respondents say yes, they agreed it would be beneficial. And then we also asked if they were current members. So um, we had a good amount of participants already engaged in the Go On network. So um, we determined that starting one for the region, um, you know, would be beneficial for them so that they could engage with other researchers within the Caribbean region that are working on similar problems. So 
benefits, we also asked about what benefits they um, would think that the GoOn Hub would have, and that includes capacity building, access to equipment, data sharing, collaborations, um, help with the SDG data reporting. So these are all things that we identified as barriers and as challenges for researchers that then were also identified as benefits that the GoOn Hub could provide. So um, the goal here of this research was really to share, to gain information from stakeholders, to learn about their needs and hear from them and start the hub from the grassroots level up in order to help them um, with their capacity building and start the network that could help facilitate these larger research priority areas for them. Um, so we know that about everyone here knows about the Go On Network, um, but it helps with capacity building, regional cohesion. So there are a lot of different groups working on ocean acidification in the Caribbean right now. And the Go On Network can really help connect the researchers with other networks and then provide um, a, you know, a hub, I guess, of uh, researchers that need support. So next steps for the region are to promote and share the fact that we have a new Caribbean hub, start building those communication streamlines, build out their network. Um, in the future, we're interested in go, um, the go on in a box kits for the region and peer-to-peer and -peer scholarship programs specifically for researchers and early career members in the Caribbean. Um, and then continue presenting um, the results to inform the community. And then eventually we are um, hoping to start a coastal acidification network, which is the domestic um, stakeholder network that we have in the United States for Puerto Rico and USVI. So focusing on um, maintaining connections with the United States and then having the Go On Hub be um, partners with that network as well. Here is a lovely photo of our hub. So we have monthly reading meetings right now and we have steering committee members from Belize, Cuba, Dominica, Jamaica, Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands. And um, really this has been a space for these researchers to connect. And um, next we're gonna be able to start facilitating um, more strategies for the hub moving forward. We have a new hub website that just went live yesterday. Um, this is the QR code, and we can also put the link in the chat so you can learn more about the hub, our goal, the goals of the hub, and then who is also members of the hub. You can also sign up to become a member of the Go On Hub here as well. And that is all I have. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Natalie. That was great. Um, now I will introduce uh, Amber Packard. She is a lab manager and staff researcher of the University of the Virgin Islands. She's currently stationed in off the, on the island of St. Thomas in USDI. She runs an environmental analysis laboratory specializing in water quality monitoring. And she works with local institutions, governments, and researchers in the Caribbean region and beyond to promote scientific collaboration across disciplines and sectors. And her presentation today is on ongoing qual water quality projects in the US Virgin Islands. You can go ahead and take, uh, go ahead, Amber, thank you. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so before I get started, I wanted to uh, thank everybody who, uh, um, participated in getting this together, all the organizers, and also anybody who's uh, tuning in um, past their bedtime or before their bedtime. Uh, so uh, this one's gonna be a little bit different than some of the other presentations that have been happening this week. Instead of focusing on one, uh, one project, I'm going to touch on some of my favorite projects that are happening in the territory right now. Um, just to kind of give an overview of what's gonna happen with the Caribbean Hub, hopefully in the um, next coming years. Um, so like Jose said, I manage an environmental lab 
on St. Thomas. And I also am a researcher. Um, and before we get into those projects, let's uh, put ourselves in uh, context. So the US Virgin Islands are um, in the Leeward Islands. So uh, they're in the Northeast section of the Caribbean. Um, the USVI is comprised of three islands. So we have uh, the Northern Islands of St. Thomas and St. John, and then uh, the Southern Island of St. Croix. And uh, I'm stationed on St. Thomas, um, right where that star is. So I know that we spend a lot of time in this virtual space, but I do want to mentally bring everybody back to the fact that I am sitting right there. Um, so if you take the next five seconds and think about where the Caribbean is, give us a wave. We appreciate it. Um, so I am stationed at the University of the Virgin Islands. We have two campuses one on St. Thomas and one on St. Croix. Within the umbrella of the university, there's the Center for Marine and Environmental Studies. Um, we have well-renowned researchers in almost everything marine. So uh, um, coral researchers, mangroves, we've got a new glider program, um, we've got an oceanography department, which is particularly um, relevant to this oceanographic or uh, ocean acidification group. And then again, under that umbrella is my lab. Um, I run the environmental analysis lab on St. Thomas. Um, we focus mostly on water and sediment. Uh, it is an analytical lab. So I spend uh, half of my time in the lab and then half my time um, in the field, either collecting samples or working on some of our uh, long-term monitoring equipment. We uh, are an island community, um, which makes high-tech solutions difficult sometimes, um, getting uh, technicians to come down and troubleshoot or calibrate equipment um, is expensive and uh, a lot of times prohibitively, prohibitively expensive. Uh, and then shipping things back and forth to different islands or um, back up to the states is also very expensive. So uh, I try to keep our solutions as low tech as possible, which is difficult because some of these uh, uh, acidification projects do require high tech solutions. But then it makes this collaborative effort so much more important. We can collaborate for the sharing of equipment um, and also with the local laboratories for different analyses that I might not be able to do in-house. Um, so let's jump into uh, three of the projects that I thought were most relevant to ocean acidification. They might also be my favorite. Um, one of them is this, I we call it, the Ambient Project. The full name is Basic Ambient Water Quality Monitoring. It's an EPA funded project that has been um, switched hands um, with who manages it, but it's been going on since the 1970s. So it's a really long data set that we have here. We measure in situ metrics like temperature, pH, salinity, turbidity, dissolved oxygen, and we also take grab samples for nutrients, which is usually, um, to right now, is total phosphorus and uh, total nitrogen. Then we also do suspended solids and uh, fecal indicator bacteria. We have 140 sites across all three islands in the Virgin Islands. And uh, one of uh, the things that I like about this um, is that everything is publicly available at this website. Like I said, it's through the EPA. It is a little bit tricky. Uh, I do spend uh, some time uh, 
talking with other researchers in the region about how to use this database. Because if you don't understand how the data is collected and how each project works fundamentally, then it's easy to misinterpret some of it. But also, the data is pretty messy because things have changed hands so many times, especially if you're talking about the data that's available since the 70s. Um, there are often disagreements in uh, the units of measure between imperial and metric, the different methods used for, especially the lab analyses for nutrients vary, and also the um, detection limits. As our technology progresses, the detection limits are getting lower and lower. And so trying to resolve those differences is uh, tricky. And then also uh, the addition of locations, the movement of locations, sometimes coastal development necessitates that we move a location and that's not really reflected in that data set. So one of the projects that I've been working on since 2019 is really cleaning up this, uh, this data set to make it a little bit more useful. This is some of the data that I've pulled, and you can see that some of it is maybe questionable. The, the pH values for 2008, I've been able to clean up a little bit, but it's still kind of, uh, that's, a, that's a work in progress. It's still kind of tricky. I've been working backwards from when I took over in 2019, uh, but this is ongoing and we sample quarterly. So we're still adding lots of data into this uh, database regularly. One of the things about living on St. Thomas is that we have pretty easy access to a mesophotic reef system. Mesophotic reefs are the ones that are below 30 meters. So they're generally inaccessible to typical divers. We have a tech diving program to be able to access and do research at these stations. Uh, Dr. Tyler Smith heads up uh, the mesophotic reef research at UBI and has recently done two deployments for pH sensors from uh, um, in 2021 for a few months and then also in 2022. These ones are recording pH and temperature at nearshore and offshore sites. So uh, that sort of work is ongoing. We are a little bit limited with the, the uh, availability of sensors. So this is another one of those projects that necessitates collaboration with different uh, agencies and organizations. And then uh, we are also doing some longer term uh, water quality monitoring in association with the Sargasm Blooms. So uh, this is that same, this is a YSI unit. Um, it's the same one that we use for that ambient monitoring, but we're gonna be able to look at things on a much smaller scale. Um, we're gonna have, or we do have six long-term monitoring uh, stations set up on all three islands, looking at temperature, pH, conductivity, turbidity, and dissolved oxygen. Um, and these are stationed at places that are uh, predictably inundated with sargasm on a regular basis. Uh, and again, uh, this is one of those uh, projects where we were able to coordinate with some local agencies, um, especially for uh, manpower to uh, offload and recalibrate these uh, units because the pH sensors tend to drift a little bit. Um, it's something that has to happen fairly regularly. Um, if anybody on this uh, call or in this meeting has uh, low cost solutions for these sorts of uh, um, devices that you love, email me, let me know. Um, we're always looking for reliable and attainable technology. Um, and uh, so those are only three of the projects that we have going on right now. It's definitely not an exhaustive list. It's just real quick overview. We wouldn't be able to do any of these projects without collaboration through uh, all of uh, these groups. Again, this is only a fraction of uh, the um, groups that we work with. Uh, since we are at a university, Natalie had mentioned that students are one of our um, big resources. And it's something that's really helpful for when uh, other groups need to do work at, um, in the territory. Uh, and we can offer that sort of support. 
Um, and so again, a huge thank you to everybody. If you have any questions about the projects that I presented or any of the other work that's happening in the territory, please uh, feel free to uh, email me um, and then enjoy the rest of the presentations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amber. That was great. And now we'll be moving on to Dr. Debbie. She is a lecturer in environmental and analytical chemistry at the University of the West Indies in Mona, Jamaica. And her research is focused on the investigation of chemical contaminants in Jamaica's fresh and marine waters and the impact of these contaminants on aquatic environments. And this work involves a study of sources and flow, the study of the sources and flow of surface and groundwaters, water pollution studies, biogeochemical processes in coastal marine ecosystems, and the investigation of submarine groundwater dis discharge. She also has a keen interest in investigating the effects of climate change on tropical marine water chemistry. And her presentation today is on supporting coastal water management, ecosystem recovery, and marine protected areas in Jamaica. Go ahead, uh, Dr. Debbie. Hi, thank you. Let me, are you hearing me clearly, I hope? Let me try to share my screen. I hope you're seeing it. Hi, good afternoon or morning, afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining us as we introduce our little Caribbean hub, our newly established, which we are all very excited about. I think Amber set a good stage for us for what's happening in the Caribbean and, and what we're trying to do. So my talk is going to continue. It's going to be similar to Amber's. I'm going to tell you about some of the work we've been doing in Jamaica particularly in a number of marine protected areas to aid in the efforts to protect our coastal water systems and of course, re ecosystem recovery. Um, wait, hang on. Ah, okay, right, I had it paused. So, so just to give you a quick overview of what I'll be talking about, let's hope I can stick to my time. I'll give you a quick intro to Jamaica and um, where my university is located. The, then I'm going to move into the location of the various marine protected areas in Jamaica and uh, the sort of research that my team and I, including collaborators, students, have been involved in as we try to contribute to the efforts being made to protect these marine or in the protection of these areas, looking at various environmental factors, including water quality, climate effects and contamination sources. So this is Jamaica located, let me see if I can bring up my pointer, located in the center of the Caribbean, a little distance away from the USVI, but still not too far. We are the third largest island in the Caribbean, about 230 kilometers long and 80 kilometers wide at our broadest point. The name Jamaica is actually meaning, uh, means land of wood and water, which originated from the original inhabitants, the Tainos that used to live on the island how many years ago, although we still have possibly some um, descendants around the Caribbean, not possibly, we do. Um, Jamaica's topography is characterized by several rugged mountain ranges, particularly in the east and along the center of the island with a very narrow um, coastal plain on which most of our critical infrastructure, towns, you know, industries, et cetera, are located. About 60% of the island's bedrock is white limestone. So it means that most of our freshwater resources are found underground. It also means that we have quite a bit of groundwater flowing to the coast, which is, you know, my interest here today. Um, so where am I located? I'm located right here in the capital, Kingston. I'm stationed at the University of the West Indies Mona campus. It is the main campus of the university, but we are a regional institution. So we also have campuses in Trinidad and Tobago, Barbados, uh, the five island campus along the small islands, as well as an open campus. So to tell you a little bit now about the research I've been doing, or my team and I have really been doing over quite a few years, this research has been focused in the coastal environment, looking at coastal water biogeochemistry. 
um, analyzing water quality, uh, looking at ecosystem effects, both from natural and anthropogenic factors. And my pet project is the impacts of surface and groundwater inputs, particularly submarine groundwater discharge, which is the flow of water, any type of water that's flowing out um, underneath the water offshore. So through sediments, through bottom sediments, through springs, et cetera. That's my pet project. This, the images here show some of the images from our research, including some of my present and former students. I know I'm preaching to the, to the converted here, but we know the importance of marine protected areas. They're important source of food. They protect coastlines from storms, support, support our marine life, et cetera. But Jamaica, like other countries, have had some serious issues in our coastal zone. We have many, many factors that have threatened our coastal habitats. We have seen declines in coral reef uh, populations. We've seen mangrove destruction, whether intentionally or unintentionally, both from natural and human effects. Um, our reefs have been particularly hit by a variety of synergenic synergenistic threats. Um, leading, um, including herbivore mortality, coral bleaching, you know the drill, pollution and um, climate change, and of course, ocean acidification. Um, <clears throat> so what we've seen happen a lot on our reefs is the transition from beautiful reefs that you see here on the left to a lot of dead areas um, covered by um, macroalgae. So as a result, Jamaica's government has set up a number of marine protected areas in association with a number of community groups, um, NGOs throughout the island. There are actually 11 ecologically important protected areas in Jamaica, including dry limestone forest in the west and the Blue and Jonker Mountains in the east. But most of our protected areas are actually offshore. As you see here, the Ocherias Marine Park, the Montego Bay Marine Park, and in Kingston, right where the capital is, there is the Port Royal or Palisados Port Royal protected area. I have worked in a number of these protected areas over the years, uh, particularly and oh, for, for many years and more recently in Montego Bay, Ocherios and in Kingston Harbor. The island also has a number of special fishery conservation areas or fish sanctuaries for short, and you can see them all on this map. Um, they're not shown on the previous map, so I brought up this one to show you. These are no take zones, so no fishing is allowed. Um, in addition to that, there are a number of coral replanting exercises being conducted in a number of these areas between Discovery Bay, Sandals, or I should say White River, Orocabessa, as well as East Portland. And um, well, these exercises or the, these replanting exercises need more support. And that's one of the things that my team and I are trying to do. We're trying to provide some more support, some more data, some more information to help to make these efforts more successful. And not just myself, by the way, there are others at the university who are also involved in similar research. <clears throat> so there is need for more studies to understand the factors that are affecting these, re these reef areas, as well as how to make these efforts more successful. So for these reasons, I've been working with a great team of researchers and students in three areas in Jamaica where we have these fish sanctuaries. Uh, the Bogue Islands Lagoon, we've done some work. They're particularly focused on the mangrove areas. In Discovery Bay, which is where my work actually first started from my graduate studies days and the East Portland Fish Sanctuary. And more recently, we have been in discussions with White River and Arakabesa Bay to start some of the same work that we're doing in these other areas with them. So what I want to do now is try to quickly, not too long, show you or give you some idea or some information about the work that we've been doing in three of these marine protected areas and fish sanctuaries. So I'll be telling you a little bit about Discovery Bay, the work in Discovery Bay, the East Portland Special Fishery Conservation Area and the uh, Kingston Harbor where the Palisados Port Royal Marine Protected Area is also um, adjoining. 
So like I said, my work started in Discovery Bay. It's actually back in the 1990s. I know I'm dating myself, but that's when I started my graduate research in the second half of the 1990s. And this was a great place to work as a, as a marine, as a, I should say, a budding marine chemist. Um, the coral reef system here has been well studied over many years, starting with the establishment of the Discovery Bay Marine Lab by Thomas Garou back in the 1950s. So this is arguably, you know, the most studied or one of the most studied coral reefs in the world. As a result, there's a lot of past data and baseline data for this particular site. Unfortunately, that's not the case for necessarily the rest of the island. The rest of the North Coast actually has a paucity of data. But this was a really great place to start. Lots of information about the ecology, not so much information about the water chemistry, which is where my project came in. But just to give you an idea of how we've been badly affected in Jamaica, the image and the, the image at the top shows what our reefs looked like back in 1975. And that's an image from Discovery Bay. Whereas in 2013, that is another image of some of the reefs in Discovery Bay. And that shows the degradation of the coral reefs from the many factors that I've told you about. And of course, this overgrowth of, of macroalgae. So my research started looking at, uh, as I said, the chemistry or the chemical characteristics of the bay. And then it moved on and I finished my PhD looking at the submarine groundwater discharge that was coming up into Discovery Bay. Um, SGD is very important in this particular bay. In fact, it's very important across much of the north coast of the island. But certainly Discovery Bay has no surface water flow, so no rivers, no streams coming in but it receives quite a bit of brackish water, brackish to freshish water from the land via various submarine springs. I mapped 63 of them back in the 90s and, and also um, seepage through bottom sediments. There are a number of ways in which we have, or there are a number of methods we have used to detect and quantify submarine groundwater discharge into Discovery Bay, these include water balances, direct measurements of flow using flow meters and benthic chambers. And more recently, I've been using uh, radon and radium activities, which are good tracers of groundwater discharge, as well as thermal infrared imagery. So this image here on the left shows, gives you some idea of some of the data that, or some of the results we've obtained. This is the location of the Discovery Bay Marine Lab on the Western side of the bay. And what you see here in blue are the cold areas signifying where the groundwater is discharging along the coast. And the, the dots here, the red dots, show some of the results we got for radon activities. We did see some, although to a lesser extent, groundwater discharge points also in Ocho Rios. So as I mentioned, Discovery Bay is in the north there and Ocho Rios is just to the east of Discovery Bay. So we've extended the work beyond this particular area and over to the next site in, well, which will come up soon. Why am I doing this? Well, I am very interested in understanding why groundwater discharge or what impacts groundwater discharge has on our coastal environment. It has not been studied much. Um, there are other areas around the world that now a lot of attention has been paid to SGD but Jamaica is still lacking in information and the impacts of SGD. For example, in Discovery Bay, there are quite a bit of inputs of nitrogen and phosphorus, particularly nitrogen directly from the groundwater. But in addition to that, the water is of lower salinity than the marine, the coastal water and lower ionic strength. So what we've seen in our experiments is that, uh, that for example, when the groundwater is coming up through and mixing with the sediments and with the, um, the overlying water, the ionic strength of the water changes. And one of the things that we're seeing happening is phosphorus desorption from sediments. So it's a potential source then um, indirectly for phosphorus, new pho quote unquote, new phosphorus entering the bay. That's a serious impact or that could be cause serious impacts for us in this particular region, which is phosphorus limited on a whole. In addition to that, I've also seen lower, we, we're also seeing much lower pH levels 
near in the vicinity of our freshwater sources right here by the marine lab compared to the rest of um, the bay and offshore waters. So this is what we think here needs a little bit more attention and we'd like to look investigate more. So moving over to the western, oh, sorry, the eastern side of the island now. So we're all the way in the east now in Portland where the East Portland Special Fishery Conservation is located. This is a six square kilometer area that has been designated a no-take zone. It is managed by the Alligator Head Foundation and we have been partnering with them over a number of years now since I believe 2016, um, looking at monitoring their or helping, assisting with their monitoring. They monitor nine sites in the area uh, as shown here in black. They patrol the sanctuary and they're also involved in uh, coral replanting exercises, which has had mixed success. Um, so this is where we're trying to help out. What you notice about the sanctuary is that uh, although it was established back in 2015 or 2016, we have not yet seen an improvement in benthic composition. It's a short time, let's be honest. It's only been since 2015, 2016, that monitoring and protection has started. Um, and so we're seeing serious impact still of whatever is going on. And that's what we're trying to find out. So for example, this chart shows back in 2017, the percentage coral cover versus algal cover. And you will see algal cover is still very high in this sanctuary. And in fact, coral cover decreased generally over the period. Um, we think it is related, of course, to um, coral bleaching events. We've had a number of those in the area, but there are other factors that could be impacting the reef. There is one good story though, or one good outcome from this story. Fish populations have increased quite significantly and we're very happy to see that. We've suffered from overfishing for many years in Jamaica. So we're really hoping that more of these efforts um, or these efforts will contribute more to bringing back our fish populations. So as I was telling you, there are a number of inputs or a number of factors that could be affecting the reefs here in the region, including quite a few sites where freshwater is coming out between a number of rivers that are flowing on the surface, as well as freshwater springs. And where I have my two little yellow asterisks here, where we have found significant amounts of submarine groundwater discharge. So all of these are flowing into the area. And this is what we're trying to assist with. In, in other words, trying to decide or to determine what impacts these may be having. So we did thermal infrared imagery and radon measurements in the area back in a study that was published in 2019. So again, we're seeing here these cold blue areas in these two harbors in the sanctuary showing significant amounts of fresh water coming into the area um, via groundwater discharge. What are we doing now? Well, more recently, uh, my student and colleagues from UT Austin, we have been collecting uh, water quality data and species composition data alongside the Alligator Head Foundation. Of course, they've been doing it for some years, so we've been assisting at these various coral monitoring sites. And we've been doing this for over a year now. Um, and we're trying to answer the following questions. Uh, what is the variability in reef communities in the fish sanctuary? And what are the environmental variables that are driving this variation? And I mean, I've listed here a few that we are investigating. So just a very quick overview of what we're seeing so far. This is from my students' um, work, Claire Williams. And so far she's seeing a certain amount of overlap in coral species in the sanctuary, but there are some important differences between the sites that are worth investigating further to determine why we're seeing such different composition across these different sites. Some preliminary, very preliminary results. These are sort of hot off the press. This is the, uh, the, the chart on the left is showing some of the salinity readings that we've obtained at the sanctuary in our water samples that we collect. These are grab samples we collect for um, nutrients and we also collect for alkalinity. Uh, quite variable because there's a quite a bit of fresh water as I showed you coming into the area. These are some of our total alkalinity results so far. Um, 
I'll show you the next one and then I'll tell you what's going on otherwise. These are our temperature readings over the period. We, we have um, loggers that have been deployed since last year. So we're collecting um, quite a bit of data for temperature, light, and pH. Um, one caveat there for pH, we rediscovered that we were having some issues with the pH loggers. So I can't show you those data. Uh, we have to, we're redeploying for, for pH and uh, which is unfortunate, but we're trying our best to get it all together. We, we, we have some data as well, but we're yet to compile those. But a big concern that we're seeing here is the temperatures. If you notice the temperatures this year have been very high and we're already seeing effects with bleaching on the reefs. The last site I want to tell you about very quickly is in Kingston Harbor, where the Palisados Port Royal Marine Protected Area is also located. Well, I should say to the south of Kingston Harbor. Kingston is Jamaica's capital city. It's highly urbanized and it's a center for business and industry. Unfortunately, the harbor has been affected very badly by various types of pollution which came with that urbanization and industrial um, the increase in industry. So we have quite a bit of solid waste that has been entering the harbor over a long period of time. Um, sewage is also a problem as well as industrial waste. In addition to that, there has been some amount of ha habitat destruction. So more recently, the Palisados Port Royal Protected Area was established to protect the important uh, mangrove communities that are found along this peninsula offshore Kingston and uh, also the offshore fisheries. So the work that we're recently doing as well in Kingston with another student, this time from the University of the West Indies, um, we're monitoring a number of sites, looking at water quality and the impacts of the surface and groundwater inputs to the harbor. I think you see the general theme. The sites circled here, are actually the sites we have so far identified quite a bit of submarine groundwater discharge entering the bay. And those are what we want to spend a little bit more attention on and then go further to look at effects on ecosystems within the harbor. Some very preliminary results, just to share with you quickly while I finish up. Um, the, the, the sort of the, the parameters, the salinity, pH, temperature, as well as the nutrients vary quite a bit. And they are related to the freshwater sources, both surface and groundwater. We have a few rivers coming in as well as gullies. Um, temperatures don't get quite as high as what we've seen or we've been seeing recently in, this, in uh, Portland. But again, pH impacted by the fresh waters coming in um, and nutrients quite variable. And some areas, again, still seeing high inputs of nutrients from the freshwater sources. So um, just to finish up, what are we trying to continue to do? Well, we're continuing our regular data collection between my colleagues from UT Austin. And I have to shout out, give a quick shout out to my uh, really close colleagues, Rowan Martindale and Ashley Matheny from University of Texas at Austin. They've been very supportive of our program and their students and my students work very well together. We want to combine community and environmental data and update GCRM and information for this year. We also want to look at past environmental conditions using isotopes because, like I said, we do not have enough baseline data, to be honest, for Jamaica, except maybe in Discovery Bay and move further to look at examining and modeling climate impacts and impacts of SGD. So just to acknowledge that none of this work would be possible without my colleagues, my students, former students present, um, as well as the funding agencies that have provided support for this work. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Debbie, that was, that was really interesting. I, I love that. Um, now we will move on to our final hub member presentation given by uh, Melissa Melendez. She is a postdoc at the, and part of the research faculty at the School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology in the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Her research focuses on observational appro approaches to address carbon chemistry and biogeochemical cycles in different ocean settings. Her approach combines various disciplines, incorporating observational methods, 
and advanced modeling techniques to explore these intricate phenomena across diverse marine environments. She's also actively involved in developing innovative tools and protocols for ocean carbon dioxide removal with a specific emphasis on ocean alkalinity enhancement. Uh, she has a PhD in oceanography from the University of New Hampshire, a master's degree in chemical oceanography from the University of Puerto Rico in my OS, and a bachelor's in environmental science from the University of Puerto Rico in Rio Piedra. And her presentation is titled Carbon Chemistry Variations in the Caribbean and Puerto Rico, Long-Term Trends and Seasonal Fluctuations. Feel free, feel free to take the, the lead, Melissa. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you for the presentation, Jose. And um, I want to just mention that I also, um, part of the hub, uh, early developments of the Caribbean um, community of practice, and I'm being very involved, um, even though in the Caribbean region, even though I'm right now stayed at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. So I'm glad to be presenting today a little bit of my work that is based in the Caribbean. Uh, let me see. I can... So um, I'm going to be presenting uh, data and uh, work from the region and from kind of open ocean um, waters, but I'm also going to be focusing on the U.S. Caribbean, which includes the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico and the U.S territories of US Virgin Islands. And the US Caribbean includes uh, around seven islands and many of uh, small islands and keys. And as they mentioned before, the Caribbean region kind of um, identified coral reefs as one of the major priorities. And this is not surprising because the, the coral reefs in the Caribbean provide uh, huge economic value around 3.1 to 4.6 billion dollars. Um, so yes, this is a highly uh, focused on, car on corals and is one of the major carbonate platforms in the world. And as many of the threats that were mentioned by pollution, water quality, one of them is ocean acidification. And I'm gonna quickly overview a little bit of um, what is what is ocean acidification and why we're studying this. Um, so the oceans, the CO2, atmospheric CO2 have increased since uh, the industrial revolution and the ocean have absorbed about 30% of all the total CO2 released to the atmosphere from human activities. And that have caused many chemical imbalances and changes on the carbon chemistry. So one of the, um, in summary, one of the consequences is the decrease in carbonate concentrations. We can decrease the saturation state of aragonite or calcite, which is what the corals use to make their skeletons. So that's why um, ocean acidification is one of the major threats to coral reefs and all the calcareous organisms like lobsters, conch, oysters. Um, so they are especially sensitive to these changes. So just starting what is happening in the Caribbean, um, the CO2 concent here we have a, a figure showing the CO2 concentration. And um, let me see if I can put the laser point. Yeah. Uh, the CO2 concentration in the Caribbean region have increased st steadily, same and following the same kind of like global trend. Um, we also have a station that measures CO2 in the atmosphere in Puerto Rico in the Southwest that I'm gonna talk a little bit later. And it also shows kind of like the same trend. And we have been increasing uh, that rate of two parts per million per year, which is also a global trend kind of average rate. In 2014, the buoy uh, the, or this station that measures CO2 in the atmosphere in Puerto Rico measures for the first time uh, 400 parts per million 
2014. And in 2015 was the full year where all of the um, measurements were over 400. Um, so yes, we are continually increasing and that have consequences into the ocean. And here we see um, figures showing the regional, in the Caribbean region, the regional pH values um, in total scale. And we can see a trend of decreasing. It has decreased, uh, the pH has decreased or the acidity have increased about 11% over the last 24 years. And this goes from 1992 to 2015. Another um, study that looked at the changes in saturation state of aragonite, which I didn't explain uh, later, but I will be happy to answer questions later. Um, this, this is like an index parameter for ocean acidification. So this Anderson, Andreas Anderson et al. in 2019 shows the changes in, in, in this index, in this saturation state from 2003 to 1963. And the red, red areas are where the major changes have occurred. And we can see that the Caribbean region is one of the um, regions that have been experienced the fastest ranges or changes in saturation state and also in uh, sea surface temperature. If we look at the um, data from the region, this is um, this, a model um, developed by the NOAA Atmospheric Oceanographic Meteorological Laboratory. <laughs> um, and this is the Ocean Acidification Product Suite, which is available from 1992 to recent 2021, I think that was the last one. And this is showing data from uh, 2020 and it shows the spatial variability in pH, for example. And it shows in here in the left side, we can see the time series data um, from 1992 to 2015. And we can see that the lowest values are in red. And um, we have a decrease in um, see in ocean pH and of around 0.4 units per year and in omega or saturation state about 0.30 units per year. And this represents an increase in the surface ocean acidity of about 11% and a decrease in saturation state of about 7.4% since 1992. And we can see there are also other parameters in this model that we can um, that we can look at. But today I'm showing just saturation state and pH. But you can see PCO2. You could also see total alkalinity, dissolved inorganic carbon, and the whole suite of carbon chemistry. And now a little bit more focused on the uh, Puerto Rico. We are now moving to the exclusive economic zone of Puerto Rico. And if we take the data from that, uh, from this region, we can also see the decreases in pH here in blue and the increases in uh, sea surface temperature. Uh, there is a regional decrease in seawater pH of about 0 0.017 units per decade. Uh, the warming trend is about 0 0.26 uh, degrees Celsius per decade. And the Caribbean surface waters are about 12% more acidic and 2.3% warmer than in 1988 and 1992, respectively. Now, um, those were model data for the regional, uh, for, for the region, but there is also um, more kind of like site specific high frequency measurements and direct measurements. Uh, this is an effort from the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program, the Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratories, the um, uh, CARICUS, which is part of the Integrated Ocean Observing System and the Coral Reef Conservation Program. And they have a network of 
buoys around uh, around the world. And we have one in Puerto Rico that is one of the longest uh, time series records of ocean acidification and carbonic chemistry in, in the region and also one of the longest of all Coda Reef areas with buoys. So this really special, uh, these observations are high frequency and uh, high quality. So we can determine with really good precision the changes over time. And this um, buoy is located in the Southwest of Puerto Rico in a coral reef system that we call Enrique Reef is um, in La Parguera and we call this a time series La Parguera uh, buoy and it's also part of the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network. And um, buoy is located in a four reef. So it measures kind of like all the processes that are happening in the four reef area. The buoy have continuous three, every three hours measurements at the surface around one, one feet or one meter, or yeah, like maybe one meter depth and um, it is, it has pH, it has temperature, salinity, it has oxygen, chlorophyll, uh, turbidity, and it also measures the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere and in CO2 concentration in the water. And if we look at these parameters and uh, we calculate the saturation state and we compare this results with the open ocean, we can see that the, um, La Barguera or the buoy see lower values compared to um, the open ocean uh, concentrations. And um, here we have the projections for the saturation state. This was the values that were prior, prior industrial revolution around 4.6. And it's predicted that this value is gonna uh, decrease by 2050 to 3.4. And for the next century, it's predicted to decrease around 2.6 or 2.5. Um, so yes, we can see that La Barguera is already kind of like close to what is predicted for, for 2050. And this is a really important parameter for many of classification organisms. And um, it kind of gives us an idea of how fast or how it is, what, what are the dynamics of the changes in carbonate um, concentrations. So yes, the sea surface aragonite saturation state uh, should be maintained about three if we wanted to actually see a robust calcification within the reef. And uh, right now it's an average of 3.3. Um, so, yeah, changes in these parameters are, are important. Here, there is some stuff of what is happening in the buoy. I just am uh, going to show you a little bit of uh, the data. Uh, seawater PCO2, we see a seasonal cycle with all of these measurements from 2019 to 2023, because I recently updated this. So we can see that in the um, winter time and spring, the PCO2 values in the waters are lower than in summer and the fall. And it can increase about 60 uh, micro atmospheres um, on average during the summer and fall. So during this time uh, where the PCO2 is higher, we can say that there is more susceptibility to um, changes in pH or changes in saturation state. We also are starting to see trends because this is a, a 13 year time series. And these are the trends in PCO2 uh, in the water in micro atmospheres. This is the anomaly we are seeing increases of around 1.8 microatmospheres per year. That means around uh, 20, that in the last 13 years, the PCO2 have increased around 23 uh, microatmospheres. And this is consistent with other kind of like forecast scenarios. So 
this site is particularly um, interesting because of that. Here we are also um, seeing the saturation state of aragonite again, um, kind of the seasonal cycle. We see that higher values are also in the winter and spring, and then a decrease in summer and fall around 0 .9, 0, uh, 0.29 units. That means that in one season, it can change around 7.7%. Uh, we are also um, observing kind of like significantly decreases over time and it's changing around 0 0.01 per year. If we looked at uh, thresholds and these are being like, I maybe haven't explained very well, but um, saturation state that are over one is far favorable to calcification or precipitation of calcium carbonate, but it's when it's less than one, it's conduce conducive to dissolution. But there is some thresholds where you can see other kind of like minerals dissolving. And in the literature, there have been like some kind of like thresholds that have been evaluated. And one of them is how when the sediment dissolution start to be favorable and it's been by others, other authors um, that I forgot to put here, but um, that 3.6, around 3.6 is a threshold for one of the minerals to dissolve. And I just wanted to see how, how much percent of the time in this particular site, we were seeing values that are below that threshold. And we are seeing that the percent of time that is under that threshold is also increasing over time. Um, so during this, uh, we can say that during this decreases on when the omega saturation state decrease is more difficult for organisms to calcify. It doesn't mean that they are dissolving specifically, but it means that it's really, uh, they have to invest more energy to, to growth. And this is just a busy plot, but I'm not gonna explain you, but I'm gonna give you an idea of what we can do. Uh, with the data we have, we can, you know, um, evaluate seasonal variability in different parameters. Here we have oxygen, we have disulfine organic carbon, total alkalinity, pH, PCO2, and saturation state. And we also validate the data from the buoys with discrete measurements, like high quality discrete measurements in the lab. And those are the blue dots. And, um, what I want to show is that during the fall and um, summer and fall and kind of entering the winter time, we have the influence of, or the Eastern Caribbean have the influence of the Amazon River and the Orinoco River plumes. And that's where we are seeing uh, low uh, sea surface salinity and alkalinities and also increases or the highest uh, sea surface temperatures and PCO2. And all of this data is published and you can um, find all of this in um, a paper that was published in 2021. We also can um, have modeled different ecosystem parameters or ecosystem processes. Uh, one of them is the net ecosystem calcification and dissolution, and we can start evaluating rates to understand a little bit more about how these processes are changing over time and during the seasonal cycle. And we can we can see that in La Barguera in Puerto Rico during summer and fall months, we are seeing high dissolution rates of, um, and this is really particularly concerning because for example, there events overlap with the beginning of the shell, shellfish spawning period for corals, for queen conch, and for spining lobsters. So during this time, fall, summer and fall, we are seeing that it's more difficult for them for calcifying. There is high PCO2 um, concentrations, there's low saturation state, and there is higher dissolution rates. 
um, how much time are in uh, calcifying. We are seeing that there is in La Palguera, which are the green dots. The blue ones are on another site in Florida, in the Florida Keys, but let's focus on the Puerto Rico one. And we're seeing that over time, the classification, the time where they are under classification is also decreasing. And this decrease started around 2014. This um, parameter, or in 2010, um, the classification time uh, decreased significantly, and it will still unclear, but that was also um, an ocean warming event or a bleaching event. So around the average time where this site is classifying is around four months. The rest of the year is in a net dissolving state. So just to give you an overview or put you in perspective of how um, classification rates are in the Caribbean and how Puerto Rico is, where what is it? Around one third of the Caribbean reefs are in net erosional, like net dissolving. And this was published by Perry et al. in 2013. And there's been a threshold that correlates the quota cover and the erosional or the dissolving states. So if, if it seem, seem that coral covers that are less than 10%, uh, that have less than 10% quota cover become net erosional. And um, here we can see data from different methods and that were collected in different areas in Las Bahamas and these are kilograms of calcium carbonate per meter square per year. And we see that Bahamas, when it's less than zero, is net erosional or net dissolving. And with this over zero is uh, net calcification. Um, so we can see Belize, Bonaire, Grand Cayman, Jamaica, Bermuda, Florida. And here it's the data that I showed you before from um, two different from the same site, from La Parguera, but two different methods. And um, we are seeing that, um, that there is really low classification rates, um, except for maybe here in Barbados. And this can have different consequences and to quarter reefs because it's suspected that um, there are regimen shifts from calcifying to not calcifying ecosystem, from a coral reef that is dominated by uh, stony corals to coral reefs that are dominated by algae. And um, we are kind of, I'm showing this just to show you that we are kind of passing these thresholds. Um, the first threshold was here when um, the CO2 levels was 300, uh, 80 uh, parts per million. And we are now observing um, CO2 levels that are over 400, 450, 500. So the next threshold would be CO2 levels that are over 500 parts per million and uh, temperatures that are over three degrees Celsius, which can have different consequences and the economy for the islands. So with that, um, I'm just gonna get over to you and thank you so much. And if you have questions and wanna know a little bit more, just, um, yeah, we're here to chat or let me know. Thank you so much, Melissa, that was awesome. Uh, we will now be moving on to the Q&A session. So feel, please feel free to ask any questions in the Q&A area or raise your hand and that's about it um uh the presentations were awesome i love them all they were all super interesting and eye-opening to the different problems and potential solutions that everybody's working on throughout the, the caribbean and hopefully we can hopefully this is the well this is the starting point but hopefully we can get much bigger in terms of personnel and members and projects and, and funding, especially like Natalie started off with. But yeah, thank you.
Yeah, I have a question if no one else does. Um, I'm curious for the hub members, what you are most excited for for the hub moving forward after hearing your presentations and I really appreciated all of the the highlights of what is currently going on in your communities. So for any, either Debbie Ann, Amber, or also Melissa. Okay, well, I think, uh, thank you again for having us. But uh, one of the main things I'd love to see more of, as I mentioned in my talk, that finding baseline data for our region is not that easy. Even if there are studies that have been done in various places, it hasn't been shared very well necessarily or may not be in a data repository that is easily accessible. And that's one of the things I'm really hoping from out of this that will come out of this network is that we have more sharing of information, more sharing of data. I just even the other day, I wanted to find some information about alkalinity in our waters. And Melissa helped me out because she has these papers. But it's not that easy to find, to be honest, if you search around online. And that's one of the things I'm hoping for. The other main thing I'm really hoping for with our hub is more collaboration among researchers within um, the region. I've just met so many great researchers as being a part of this hub for the last few months and all of you here and others. And I'm just looking forward to seeing where it goes and how much more we can get done as a team, you know, as a group. Awesome. And I have one that kind of mirrors uh, that a little bit. First of all, uh, collaboration is uh, how we do great science. And so uh, um, groups like this just will be able to really push uh, this kind of work forward. Um, but also in that realm of information that's difficult to find, I feel like um, finding things that haven't worked is often really difficult. Um, uh, nobody not nobody, um, oftentimes things that haven't worked uh, in the, these uh, these kind of projects aren't published. So it's really these sorts of uh, meetings and interactions where you're talking to your colleagues and you're like, I'm about to try uh, this, um, this new uh, methodology or I'm gonna deploy this piece of equipment in this way. And uh, you can uh, talk with people who have already done something like that and they can say, you know what, we tried that. These are the kind of results that we got. Why don't we, uh, you know, talk about maybe a different method for those sorts of things? So, so moving forward, this is going to be great. <laughs> I'm very happy that this um, hub came to finish or to form after many years of like working to push this uh, science. I was a student in Puerto Rico. Um, saying in big meetings that the Caribbean region was not represented and being in the OA Caribbean task in the community of practice and now in the hub as uh, in the hub it's nice to see that finally is kind of formal and it has formalized and have a group and there is many people involved in the success or the formation of this hub that been working for many years. Um, so I also want to mention that I'm very excited to develop the capacity needed in the region. Um, I've been working with the Ocean Foundation to um, distribute the OA, the Goaon OA kids. And we have worked with people from Jamaica and probably that was one of the first efforts in Colombia and Panama where we met people from Jamaica, Marcia and, and met many others in the regions that were screaming for, for help and also screaming for their enthusiasm, enthusiasm for like studying away and the lack of, of, of capacity in the region. So I'm very excited to move forward some of those efforts and working together to, yeah, do more trainings and, and collaborations. Sorry, I do have a question for Debbie. Um, 
So you do submarine groundwater discharge. Have you identified any like sources of that groundwater? Like, are there big aquifers or anything like that? I'm just interested in where the water comes from, I guess. Oh yeah, Jamaica, as I mentioned, is mostly limestone. Our bedrock is like 70, 60 to 70% limestone, much of which is very porous. And so we actually have quite a bit. Uh, most of our water, res freshwater resources are underground and a lot of it, we think is flowing to the coastline. Um, certainly that's what I've been focusing on since my graduate work. I mean, I branched out, of course, I know I'm new to ocean acidification, but um, I am very interested in, in mapping those sources of groundwater. I've only been able to do it so far in a few areas, as I showed you along the North Coast and started now, I'm doing some in Kingston Harbor. But the goal really is to map the entire island right around the coastline and, and quantify just how much groundwater discharge is coming out offshore and the impacts, very importantly. I'm always thinking about the impacts on the marine environment <clears throat> and the ecosystems within. So that that's, like I said, I found it very interesting. I'm looking at all these data that I have from Discovery Bay and other areas, looking at pH and temperature and how that may be impacting the coral reef systems in good ways and bad ways, maybe, because we're seeing that, you know, the reason Discovery Bay must have adjusted to these cooler waters coming in from, and low salinity waters coming in from the groundwaters over, you know, however many years, but just now to understand, you know, all the various factors that are impacting our reefs, including that which has not been much at or not much attention has been paid to. Thank you. That was that was very enlightening. The okay. Yeah, so since we only have a minute or so left, um I'll go ahead and give you a little bit more information and then close the session. So um one of the Nick Nicole's asking if the link to the Caribbean webpage can be posted. Um, so I am putting the Caribbean Hub page again in the chat. And once this Zoom is um, completed, this will also be a recording. And we will share this as well as a resource for the Caribbean Hub. And um, overall, we want to say thank you to the organizers and the moderator of the session, Jose, as well as all of the presenters. So thank you so much for making it, what, such a wonderful debut for the Caribbean Hub in this webinar. And we also wanna thank you, the audience, for joining us for OA Week 2023. So please do not forget to consult the website for additional sessions that you can sign up for. And I'll put that um, link in the chat as well here. Um, and we also want to remind you that um, you can sign up for Go On and stay up to date with Go On information if you join as a member on the Go On page. And you can find that link through the Caribbean Hub website or also through the Go On website. And also, if you'd like to learn more about ocean acidification research for sustainability, you can scan the QR code on this and also drop another link in the chat that has more information about the ORS commitment. So with that, I would like to say thank you so much for joining. We hope you enjoy OA Week, and we hope to see you on further sessions as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Polina, and everyone. Bye.